first came to Magnet, I, I did not know anything about this area. And uh, it was actually Mr. Trudeau and then uh, Miss Dion Procell that got me to come down here. And when I first came down, uh, not only am I a little bit of a history buff, but I also just love walking in the woods. And that's what I was first uh, most focused on was I could not believe this was actually down here. To, uh, trails that led down to the uh, bayou and there was all sorts of waterfowl and everything. But then as they were talking to me and I learned a little bit more about the history, um, it is amazing how important this little piece of property was for the formation of Shreveport and all that we know. And um, most people, I would say probably over 90% of the population of Shreveport don't even know this exists. In 2005, Jan Sol, Montessori School for Shreveport teacher and former Montessori parent, started paying particular attention to the neglected green space and bayou that sits in between Stoner Hill and Anderson Island neighborhoods. He soon found himself leading an effort to create a nature trail through the wooded area. I didn't really know much of the history when making the trail, to be honest. Um, I was just really excited by um, the fact that this was undeveloped and it was right in the middle of the city in between two neighborhoods and um, it was really the green space and the wildlife that excited me first because I didn't, I didn't understand, didn't know any of the history, didn't understand how this waterway was part of an older, um, a larger, older, uh, old river system. Started with all of those, um, without those really even being questions, um, until we started the work of cleaning this up. And then with that, you know, all of the intrigue about the history of it started. Retired Magnet High social studies teacher, local artist, and former Montessori parent Robert Trudeau joined Jan Sol's efforts to create what is now the Coates Bluff Nature Trail. Mr. Trudeau came to regularly use the trail with students and encourage other Magnet teachers to use this trail as well. Here, in an interview with Magnet student Daniel Bay, class of 2018, Mr. Trudeau, or Trudeau as he is affectionately known, reflects on the trail, its use, and the history of the area. One of the first things that John Sol did as a teacher at Montessori School of Shreveport was get a group of students, my son Jet was one of those students, and say, let's research Anderson Bayou in this area, this old part of Pier Bayou, and find out if it's connected to the Red River. They did their research, including going downtown to the courthouse. They got in the canoes, they got their hiking shoes, they, they, they followed the route, they, they looked at the maps, and they came to um, distinct proof by their trekking that this was once connected to the Red River. So it has been a site for education uh, as well as a site for history. Magnet student Emily Boykin, class of 2018, reached out to local retired archaeologists from the state of Louisiana and incidentally, former Magnet parent Jeff Gerard, to find out more about the ancient peoples who inhabited this area. Well, we can trace the Caddo people back to at least the 10th century AD. Uh, before that, there were still people who lived here all the way back to the Pleistocene or the late Ice Ages, 12 to 14,000 years ago. Uh, but the material culture was much different before about the 10th century. But from that time on, the people are making the same kind of pottery. They're living in the same villages to a certain degree. Uh, they're growing corn, growing crops and we can trace those folks all the way up to historic times to the historic Caddo. There were several different groups of Caddoan Indians who were part of a confederacy. The Caddoan homelands included much of our Red River. The headwaters of the Red River of the South are in far eastern New Mexico and the Texas Panhandle. The river has one of the most erodible beds in the United States, 
which is why the river created the Great Raft, a massive log jam which probably formed over hundreds of years, and we know stretched up to 150 miles long from Natchitoches to the Arkansas border. The Great Raft created several lakes and bayous, some of which no longer exist due to river engineering. Native Americans, such as the Caddo's, bypassed the Great Raft and participated in an elaborate, extensive trade network using bayous the raft created, like Bayou Pierre, which exited the river a few hundred yards south of the Stoner boat launch. If you wanted to carry something over land, you had to carry it by hand. There were no wooden carts or wagons. Travel was slow. If you could move something by boat, that was the fastest and easiest way to go. Over water in dugout canoes or over land, early Indian peoples traded ornaments, what we call prestige goods, that probably were just going to the leaders of the societies, and that trade network was huge. We know that there were marine shells going to the Midwest. We have copper items that are coming down from the Great Lakes in Illinois, down to this area. So, Indians were trading over very large areas. Retired state archaeologist Jeff Gerard. In canoes, such as the one on display in the Louisiana State Exhibit Museum, and the one recently found near Belcher, Louisiana this past summer, the Caddo's traded other items, such as bois d'arc wood, dried yopon leaves, and pottery with other groups of natives in faraway places such as Cahokia, a huge trading and ceremonial center that around 1200 had as many as 20,000 people living in or near the city, which was more than medieval London at the time, which is near present-day St. Louis. About how many Caddo's lived in the Arklatex? So by the late 18th century, there were only a few hundred Caddo folks left. Uh, in the early 18th century, they outnumbered the, the European settlers in the area, but that changed. People began to come into the area and, dis and disperse north of Natchitoches all the way up almost into this area. Traditionally hunted and fished, they couldn't do that anymore. They were getting uh, pushed off their land. Relationships became more and more antagonistic through time. Where was the first United States government Indian agency house in this area, and where did the Caddo's see their lands in 1835. Indian factories is what they called them in those days, and the head person was a factor. And it was really a trading post, that's what that, that meant. And uh, the first one uh, was established in Natchitoches shortly after the Louisiana Purchase, about 1805. John Sibley, uh, you may have heard of, uh, was the, the first factor. Uh, then I believe it was about 1818, they moved it up to a place called Sulphur Fork. And Sulphur Fork is uh, where the Sulphur River uh, emerges into the, <laughs> uh, into the Red River. And at Sulphur Fork, it stayed there for a, a number of years, and I believe about 1825, they moved it down to what they call Caddo Prairie. And Caddo Prairie is up in the north part of the parish, up near the, the town of Gillum in, in that area. Uh, then, I, I think it was about 1831, 1830, it finally moved down into town here on a place called Peach Orchard Bluff. Retired Magnet Social Studies teacher Susan Keith sat down with Magnet student Jamie Lynch to reflect on the time a man walked by her classroom many years ago and how that sparked her interest in studying the history of Coates Bluff. He asked me about Coates Bluff and did I know about it? And he said his name was James Ashley Sibley and that he was the great-grandson of Larkin Edwards. And Larkin Edwards was one of the original founders of Shreveport and an early resident of Coates Bluff. He had put up the original historical marker at Uri and Olive, and it had been removed, uh, fell down, been removed, whatever, and he wanted to replace it. And so I was the uh, sponsor of the History Club, and he decided that uh, it would be a great project for us to replace the marker. We had a dedication ceremony here and had a lot of dignitaries here. And uh, the marker's there and a lot of documentation was, was uh, preserved because of that project. And that was kind of how it all started with me. The Caddo Indians learned to benefit from the Great Raft's existence, even though sometimes 
They referred to it as the Evil One. The raft shifted each season, and waters flowed over the banks and receded, leaving fertile soil for the Indians to farm. The massive, mobile log jam also protected them from outside threats for hundreds of years. Whether these enemies were other Native Americans, Spaniards, French, or Americans. Well, the Caddo's did a lot of their travel by lakes and rivers and bayous. And of course, because of the log jam, there were a lot more bayous and lakes than there are now, including Silver Lake, which covered much of the southern part of downtown. And so they had to use those bayous to travel, and they had to portage or carry their, their pirogues from one body of water to another. So it was, it was something they dealt with every day in terms of travel. After the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, and until the 1835 Caddo Land Cession Treaty, any non-Caddo without permission from the U.S. government would have been trespassing on native land. Historical records indicate that first Anglo-American to settle near the convergence of Bayou Pierre and the Red River was native Tennessean Larkin Edwards. He learned the Caddo language, and possibly after his first wife died, married a Caddo woman. Some years after Larkin Edwards settled here, other Anglo-American settlers arrived. The historical marker that Susan Keith and her students helped erect years ago references a man named James Coates, who settled here sometime around 1817, which would make this the 200th anniversary of his arrival. Magnet student Tia Jones recently sat down with local historian Dr. Gary Joyner to discuss the history of Coates Bluff and the old village's namesake. He picked this place because it was high up on a bluff, it would not flood, and there was uh, uh, an easy way for him to make a road, basically, from where um, he decided to settle uh, down to a hairpin turn in the stream. So he saw it as a really strategic place for uh, having a trading post, and um, all things being equal, uh, it should have been where Shreveport began. His uh, trading post, which was very, very close, uh, sat between the two school campuses. Like most trading posts, others come and, and build settlements or houses next to them, so it was a village. Um, can't tell you how many people were there, but it was large enough that it got a federal post office, and that's why Henry Shreve wanted to kill it, because he didn't want a competitor that close. When Henry Shreve came up with a federal contract to clear the log jam known as the Great Raft, he was looking for a place that he could set up businesses with like-minded people. And, instead, and he didn't get along with Coates. Coates actually filed a suit against Henry Shreve. The suit is in the Natchitoches Parish records today, and we've got congressional testimony where Shreve says that not only did he not get along with him, he tried to buy and did buy out um, a disgruntled Natchitoches citizen. Well, the disgruntled Natchitoches citizen was Jim Coates. Henry Shreve wanted to... Um, have a place that he could control. He could not control Coates. William Bennett, his wife Mary, and their business partner, James Huntington Kane. Uh, and they had a trading post on both sides of the Red and a ferry. And so he linked up with them, and it was Henry Shreve that laid out the 64 blocks, the 16 streets of downtown Shreveport. As people came in and decided to, to uh, you know, make their way west, they sold them goods. They repaired their wagons, they were blacksmiths, there were people who sold fabric, there were people who sold tools, there were people who sold uh, food that was sustainable, uh, dried fruits, dried meat, that type of thing. So it's very much a frontier town. If you were Captain Miller Shreve, what would you have done as far as clearing the raft? Do you agree with the strategy he used? Well, he was a genius. 
Um, his snag boats, which he invented, cleared the river in record time and under budget. But since the boats he designed were built while he was working for the United States Corps of Engineers, he couldn't receive a patent or he couldn't re receive profits from their sale or use. Maybe that's why he agreed to work with the founders of Shreveport. And he got 25,000 acres of land, which he sold to get the profits, and he moved to St. Louis to live out his life in his daughter's home there. He also dug a ditch, cutting a loop in the, cutting off a loop in the river where Coates Bluff and the new post office were located. He had suggested this cut before to the federal government because it would shorten the river's length, but he stood to benefit from cutting off the existing town of Coates Bluff so that the post office could be moved two miles north to the proposed Shreve Town. And the legend says he took a few workers and made the cut in the river at night. So the citizens of Coates Bluff awoke to a mud ditch where their river had been. The river was allowed to resilt again and again, and the money to keep clearing the river was removed by Congress from the federal budget in the 1840s. Still, there were clearings of the river done at certain times, but the constant budget for it no longer existed. So you can't blame him for not keeping the river clear. When Kane and Bennett opened their trading post in what is now downtown Shreveport, what was the status of the log jam at this point? Okay, uh, that's a great question. The, the log jam um, was not a solid thing. Uh, by the time Shreve gets here, it's about 110 miles long. It had eaten its way north. It rots off the bottom end and builds on the northern end as logs are added, and then logs on the on the downstream side uh, sort of fall off and you know rot and become dirt. So it had moved up, and Henry Shreve was clearing um, above Clo Coates Bluff and right at. By you, Pierre. He shoved. We know that he shoved uh, logs into Bayou Pierre to kill it, and also to Sand Beach Bayou, which is at the the southern tip of Shreve Island. You mentioned a steamboat landing. Is that currently the Hopewell Cemetery? Hopewell Cemetery sits at the top of that road going down. Hopewell Cemetery is just to the south of it. At the bottom of that old road, along where your trail is, the walking trail, yes, sir. at the very bottom of it, you'll, you'll notice there's water down there. That's Old Red River. That is, that is Red River as of, of about 1837 or 8. You can always tell a steamboat landing because it's sort of wallowed. It, it turns into sort of a U-shaped thing because as the boats come in and then leave, they, they can't go in in a straight line. And so they wallow. They, they pull back and forth, sort of wiggle. Actually be able to, to take a short walk and experience all this right here in their own neighborhood is pretty awesome. I think just really the um, wanting to give access to um, this um, protected green space. Oh, I do. I mean, I'm right. I'm right along. I have. I am now, and I have always. I've started as a student. Um, to this project and now more so than ever I have stu other students such as yourself asking me questions that I realize like uh, I don't know the answer to that you know and um, so I am I'm proud of that I'm proud that we now have um, a growing um, awareness and interest and um, you know people that want to know more and the more we learn the more excited um, everybody becomes um, about preserving this trail. And that's really at the heart of it for me. I think it's vital to us. Uh, if, 
if we don't study it, who will? If we let it go, who will forget? And that's everybody. Uh, history is a very tactile thing. It's a very personal thing. It's not just something you read in a book. You need to go out and see it. You can, you can feel the dirt. You can look at the water. You can see where people have changed things, like making that road. And it becomes, you know, it's vital for us to know who we are. You, you don't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. And that's, that's the, I, to me, that's my motto. It's